I'll start out with a little bit about me. Um, you can find me on IRC uh, infrequently, but occasionally uh, as M. Hewitt. Doesn't look like it, but that's how, it's, that's how I do it. Uh, MJ Hewitt on uh, Google Hangouts and uh, M. Hewitt at OpenNMS.org. Um, I'm one of the initial members of the uh, Order of the Green Polo. Um, so is anybody familiar with the Order of the Green Polo here? So 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 long time ago, yeah, <laughs> hopefully Taurus is. Yeah. Taurus decided that uh, he wanted to recognize a lot of the, the contributions that were being done out in the community. Um, and so uh, for those of us who were contributing heavily pretty early on, um, he thought, well, what can I do to kind of honor that? Uh, and uh, he thought of uh, the Masters um, golf tournament and said, well, they've got the green jacket, so this will be similar to that. There's also the order of the blue polo, um, which also kind of recognizes, recognizes uh, contributions as well. Um, I'm mostly a network guy. Uh, I kind of uh, backed into doing development stuff for, for OpenOS. I still kind of consider myself a, a network guy. Um, and I've, I've got a continuously running instance of OpenMS since uh, 2001. Um, I think I looked at it the other day. There's 167 million events that have been collected in, in, in my instance of OpenNMS. Okay, a little bit more about me. <laughs> so I work for a uh, children's hospital system um, in Minnesota. And uh, so we have about 350 pediatric beds, um, which is usually the unit of measure for health care is, you know, how, how big are you, how many beds do you have, how many, how many patients can you see. Uh, it's a pretty good size IT environment. What's interesting about healthcare IT is you have many diverse business groups within that that those 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 walls, and uh, so you see a lot of uh, different kinds of devices. You know, so 4,500 PC <coughs> devices, about 3,000 network attached um, medical devices. So those medical devices are anything from uh, uh, intravenous fluid pumps, pumping uh, uh, drugs into kids. Uh, yeah, uh, about 500 virtual servers. I got about 1,000 wireless guests at any one point in time. Um, you know, these are the, the, the parents of the, of the children staying at the hospital or their, or their siblings or even the patients themselves. Um, I supervise, I'm now a supervisor and I supervise a team of seven. Um, I kind of call them nuts. Uh, network, Unix, telephony, and storage. So kind of a very wide wide bit of stuff that I have to cover. Um, I've done a little bit of work under Chef now. I've got, got one commit that they accepted so far. Uh, we also use Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. That's a recent thing for us to start doing. It's a very interesting project. Uh, if you haven't used it, I'd look into it. I'm also the, as, you, as you've heard me before, I'm the OpenMS Dev Jam Julie. So <laughs> So that's our, uh, if, if you ever saw the Love Boat series from the U.S. in the 80s, there was a cruise director. She took care of everybody, and that's what I do during Dev Jam. And my colleague, Ron Roskins, there in the center. Um, you can find him on IRC more often than me. Uh, Ronald Roskins on Google+. He's uh, Unix admin since 1992. Long time. Yeah, long time. Uh Went to the University of Minnesota where everybody, uh, where the Dev Jam is held. Um, it was an interesting time for me as I'd been using a computer since <coughs> a young age and got to use the Unix systems that they had at the university there. Um, got, in tr got involved with the student chapter of ACM and they had a computer lab there and I was able to bring one of my computers in and uh, set it up on the internet at that age. Um, so I had started off with the Amiga, use, uh, Amiga Unix, uh, had a file system problem and switched over to NetBSD at the time. Uh, was a student sysadmin at the university there for a while and then uh, just got after that worked uh, for a couple of various different companies around. In 2008, I had started a new job and started using OpenMS and then have been using it for the last five years. It's uh, been a whirlwind. It's been interesting getting a few of my commits into OpenMS and seeing 
the changes that it's made over, over the past couple of years. And then Ron works for BI Worldwide, so there is the Unix sysadmin on a team of four, uh, 13 physical servers, 1,200 virtual servers, uh, 600 external customers' websites. And BI, BI provides uh, um, services to companies to help and send employees, uh, sales staff, and, and, and other employees to uh, provide, you know, provide good service. Um, all right, so a lot of this is going to talk about augmenting OpenNMS with scripting. Um, I don't want anybody to be scared to run out of here right away with that. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about why I think that's important and why I think everybody should should be thinking about you know how how about scripting in their future. You got a quick question. So how many people are systems people here? How many people are network people here? And how many people are both? Okay, that, I think that's pretty typical for the OpenMS community that a lot of us tend to, to straddle that border between the two. And, and I've kind of divided this talk a little bit into, into both sides a little bit. Um, you know, myself, as I said, you know, I, I have both, you know, uh, Unix admins and, and network admins. You know, as I said, I came up through the network side, but I've been administering an open NMS box for 12 years. I picked up a lot of tricks along the ways. <laughs> um, so anyway, so kind of what Ron and I have learned in some of the tricks we're going to share with you are, you know, that you can gain a lot of flexibility uh, by just <coughs> just a minimal amount of scripting and basically taking the data that, that may not be readily available to you but but making it exposed so that OpenMS can grab that and do a couple things. You know, so it's it's monitoring and it's it's data collection, right? Those are the things that we, we love about OpenMS. Um, and just so you know, scripts can be run on either on the OpenMS host itself or maybe on a client device um, that's out there in the network. And uh, the other thing is, depending on how you do it, you know, we're going to talk about you know three main things: uh, BSF monitor. Does anybody use BSF monitor? <laughs> anybody use GP monitor? Okay. Uh, how about uh, XML collector? HTTP collector. All right. Anybody extended NetSMP? Okay. So that's a little, little redundant for some of you. That one. So I thought I'd talk about some arguments here that, that I hear frequently. Um, I'm a system engineer. Why do I need to learn to script? May I ask you? Yes. Because you are a system administrator. <laughs> 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 but but how, ma how many people have met system administrators who have never written a script in their lives? Only I, Windows people. What's that? Only Windows people. Yeah. I mean, that's the big thing. That's true. Um, and, and right now, there's a really key reason behind this. Is, is DevOps in my mind. Um, and so, you know, that's a big flashy term that's being used a lot and we're, have, we're seeing a lot. So how many people, how many people use DevOps in their day-to-day -day lives? So, so one of you guys want to define DevOps? Well, actually, yes. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to mix both aspects of IT with enough need. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so I kind of took a swag at it a little bit. Um, this is from an ops guy. Long, you know, all my life I've been an ops guy. To me, it's you know, developers are creating these environments and they're expecting to just throw them over the wall. Operations catch, figure it out, right? I mean, that, that's that's been a been a pretty, pretty typical one. Um, just making a new one, just like that one that I had before. After they've been mucking about with it for weeks, days, months, years, even sometimes. Um, but the other thing is, is that we can learn from the developers using agile methods. So learn about the iterative process of, of developing a system. And, and that's what I kind of think is, is beautiful about this. This is a great, great way to bring, you know, both from a communication standpoint, but also from, you know, if we're, if we're able to speak the same language because we're using the same tools, you know, incorporating Git you know, into, into things that we're doing, you know, so storing configuration files and things like that. And Chef and Puppet, those things are going to, are tool sets that, that really are, you know, kind of an agile workflow when you look <coughs> at it. Um, I'm kind of a, a Chef guy and, and, and now I'm going the Burke Shelf way, which, which is even more that direction, I think. Um, but I thought this picture was great because 
I think it really does illustrate what we talk about, you know, and the fights that we have. Um, so the other side is, I'm a network administrator. Now, even, now, how many people have met a network administrator who's never written a script in his life? I mean, that one's much more frequent. Um, and I think it's software-defined networks. I think that's the big thing. Um, how many people have, have, have an idea of what software-defined networks is? Okay, now I'm going to put you back on the spot. <laughs> Can one, one of you define it for me? You have to. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin almost has to. Not so, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, but in essence, it's, it's the ability to be able to um, flexibly configure the network without making physical changes to it. So, again, I took another swag at it. To me, the plumbing is predefined. What do I mean by plumbing? The speeds and feeds. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hook up all the physical first. My physical plant's going to be fixed. And uh, you're not going to do single device administration anymore. I'm not going to be telling anything to do a switch anymore to, to say, I need to turn up a port today for this user. First off, we're never going to go anywhere if that's all we ever do as network, network guys. <laughs> you know, that's... That's the big thing. Um, we need to, that's just the everyday thing that everybody expects, right? What we need to do is be able to take that next level. And, and that's where I think uh, the other thing is the configuration needs to be consistent. If, if I've seen anything over my near 20 years as, as a network administrator, consistency is the one thing that, that will drive high availability. Um, I, I'd rather have things consistently wrong than inconsistently right. Uh, the other thing is, SCN allows us to tailor the network, and this is really the software layer of the network, for the applications. So, uh, and the other thing is commodity silicon and hardware, and I think that's the big thing that I think a lot of people look at and say, oh, I'm going to save money. No, you're not. You're going to transfer that cost from that capital outlay for buying the equipment to that intellectual outlay and, and labor outlay to maintain that. So to me, these things are the same. Both are moving towards a highly consistent environment. There's just two different approaches. Both are about creating the, the best environment for each, each application. So you're not no longer are you building a network or a server for any application that comes along. You're saying, okay, I, I understand <coughs> what the requirements are for this application. I'm going to replicate that every time I, I do it. And both require a large amount of automation. And, and, and we say automation, but the reality is it's a lot of labor. There's a lot of just people using their brains to do their jobs. All right, so that's, that's kind of my soapbox. I'm going to get off, off of that, and we'll kind of get into the, the main topic now. So Ron and I kind of talked about this uh, before we came. We said, okay, what is strange data? And to, to me, this is data that is not exposed by normal means. So a lot of applications are, are pretty good about giving us data through, say, SNMP. Well, not so many. Um, some of them are good about exposing it via JMX. Okay, not so many there either. <laughs> Some of them even use HTTP. You know, they throw up a little web server and publish stats. Okay, that's a little more common, it seems like. Um, but the reality is that sometimes we gotta, we got to work to get the data out of the systems. And then the other thing is, is that sometimes it's bus is business-specific data. Maybe this is data that's generated by an internal application that is maybe not something that you even need for, from, a, from an infrastructure person uh, background to, to see, but there's one set that I've got that, that I pull that, that that's kind of been interesting to see <coughs> how that affects how the infrastructure performs. Um, so a couple things we're going to talk about is you know like uh, uh, Ron's got some storage systems that uh, are not very friendly to any of those things. Um, that all they have is an API. And so Ron's picked up some things to expose that data so he can, he can do data collection on it. And then also about systems monitoring. So we'll get into that a little bit more later. 
So again, this is not native SMP MIB data. So that's where we're going to talk about extending the MIB and what you can do to do that. And what there's some pitfalls to that. We're not going to go too deep into that. Um, there's ways to even expose more via JMX. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, this data is not usually accessible. And syslog2 is another. So a lot of applications write a text file somewhere that you can't really get off box very easily. You can't ship it over to OpenMS and, and deal with it there. Uh, and I talked about business specifics. So the one, the one statistic that I found that was interesting how it correlated to systems and network performance was the number of beds that were occupied in the hospital. I mean, if you think about that, that makes sense because the more children there are being cared for, the more staff there are taking care of them. And so it's been, it was interesting to kind of see how almost a direct correlation there was between those, those statistics to see. What's even, what's even stranger is that the amount of web browsing also goes up. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't understand that. It, it, maybe it's the parents. I don't know. Um, you know, another example some of you gave me is, you know, just if you're in a manufacturing environment, it might be a similar correlation to see, you know, how many widgets were, are, did we produce today. You know, maybe that will show you some correlation. And, and, and what I'm finding is, is that uh, that it's not so much that I can do anything with that data yet. I'm still trying to figure out how do I use that data? How can I react to that data? How can I um, be smart about that data? Uh, but it does kind of give you those days where you go, gee, why is, this, why is everything such a pain in the neck today? Well, we've got a lot more patients today. I don't know, are there any other ideas you know, out there of business type things that you might want to gather in OpenMS that might be beneficial to you as? Number of cans of 7 up <laughs> How much cheer wine you have left in the uh, vending machine? How many Germans are on site, does that mean? Is that what that? <laughs> Number of Germans goes up, amount of cheer wine goes down. Um, sorry. And I kind of hinted at some of these other things. Um, log messages, a lot of lot of text-based logs. You know, a lot of systems still just spew data into there. And and what I'm going to talk about, an example I have around that is uh, extending SNM, net SNMP. There's a a log match uh, option in there, and so sometimes it's about the frequency of the message. It's not necessarily. I don't care. You know, so this would be like we would do this in alarms natively in, in, in OpenMS. But sometimes it's about the frequency, um, and in my particular case it's about the correlation of one kind of message com coming up and another kind going down that, that kind of help me solve some problems. Um, and then also sometimes these formats are really funky, and, and we need to do some work to get what we really want out of them. And that's, that's where it gets kind of, kind of fun to, 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 to figure that out. <laughs> And then uh, integration testing end to end. Um, so some some things th some things don't break in a consistent manner. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed that. <laughs> and sometimes the only way to get that data that that something's broken is to wait for that user call. And so this is about how how do you how do you put that into OpenMS that I'm 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 not going to get that user call first. I'm gonna I'm gonna get the data in OpenMS first. I'm gonna get an alert from OpenMS. So I got a quick question. So survey on uh, how many people uh, um, do stuff in Perl? How many people do stuff in PHP? Only one force. <laughs> Only one force. I, I got a couple too. Uh, Ruby. Groovy. <laughs> JavaScript. All right. So. So that's good to see. You know, most people have done some 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 kind of scripting. Um, and and uh, does anybody have a favorite? I mean, is is it just is it just what tool am I really feeling like today? Is that a pretty typical? Yeah, that's kind of my problem too. I, I tried. Uh, uh, I I I was talking to somebody and they're going, well, what what would you write this? And I'm going, ah, I don't know. I don't know. You know, they wanted to say, well, I need I need a list of the uh, of <coughs> all the hosts that have connected to the server in the last hour. 
You know, well, let me think. What, what did I do last week? I was doing some stuff in Ruby. Well, that's not going to work too well. <laughs> um, it's an interesting problem, by the way. Think about that one. <laughs> uh, so, this won't be too, sh too shocking then. Uh, the rest of this, I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm running fast. I'm, I'm talking fast today, so uh, I'll try to slow down. Um, I'm going to go into the BSF monitor. So is anybody familiar with BSF other than Jeff? So it leverages the Apache Bean Scripting Framework. So the Bean Scripting Framework allows you to use other languages within Java. In particular, uh, I just pulled, this is a few of them, there's, there's about 10, but these are probably the most popular and what we're going to see the most of. I forgot to ask Python too, that's the other one I should ask. Uh, JRuby, Python, JavaScript, Java using Bean Shell, which is a little different, just so you know, and Groovy. Um, I found Groovy the easiest to work with with this. Uh, I attempted to do some, some stuff in JRuby. Jeff's informed me that that should work now, or thinks it might work now. Uh, so I, I, I need to go and look at that. I'm always way behind on code. I just never get caught up. So this is a little bit of, a little more in depth of what BSF Monitor needs. So you need a map, which is all the parameters that are passed to the monitor, the IP address of the device, and that's what's automatic, <coughs> is the IP address, the node ID, the node label, the service name. Um, and then the instance as well, and then the results, and I think there's actually four, four results that are, that are by default there, okay, and okay, unknown, and of course I forgot the fourth one. Um, I'll look that up later. So it's fairly simple. You know, you're, you're writing you're writing some scripts, some action, and you return back. And this is just for status polling, right? So you're going to return back that, yep, completed the poll, or nope, something went wrong. Um, and by doing that, then you're able to say, okay, that process worked. So the use case that I had was our NAS system, network attached storage, has a process where you write a file to it. It takes that file and says, oh, that's a new file. I need to have that checked by antivirus. So it sends a flag over to the antivirus system. The antivirus system says, oh, there's a new file. Let me scan that for you. So, so, th so from the NAS to a Windows server running McAfee or Symantec, they then scan that file, and it says, okay, I, that, that file is clean, all right, not clean. I will send a delete command back to, to the NAS. NAS gets that command and says, okay, I will purge that file, and off it goes, and I'll write a message out to my log. So the problem we kept running into was the fact that that's a lot of steps. <coughs> There's a lot of points where that could break. So first off, the service that, 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 that does that communication on the NAS has to be running. The service that does the communication with the NAS on the Windows box has to be running. The antivirus software has to be running. And then that, all that communication has to occur. So as I would instrument each of those little tiny pieces, Something new would change and something would break, and, and I had a lot of work to do um, to fix it every time. Because of course, you know, McAfee would change something. The what it's called the the Solera antivirus agent would change on the Windows side. The Solera end would change. Endless headaches. Um, so I needed a way to do an end-to-end -end test, and and I think this is also going to increase as we as we move forward in our in evolution of how, how things work. Um, and so to me it was, you know, scripting ultimate to the rescue. So I wrote this up on the wiki when I did it. Um, so it's out there. 
I got to see if it's drifted off from what I've got in production, but uh, it should be fairly, fair, fairly similar. I think the things that I've had to change over time is that sometimes uh, the amount of time that that delete takes varies depending on how busy the system is, and so I've had to tweak that over time. Um, I also wrote, decided that uh, I learned that I needed to write more than one file because sometimes things happen. <laughs> And, and, and so I, I write, I think it's 10 or 20 now. The other thing is I had this on a five minute poll and the AV guy came and knocked me about because he, he was sick and tired of getting 10 messages in his log every five minutes. So we have, you know, up to, I think I, I <coughs> it's either four or six times a day or six hours or four hours, I can't remember, in between on the polling cycle. So has anybody ever heard of the ICAR file? So that's a standard antivirus file that all the vendors have agreed that they will flag as a virus. Um, so I write a series of those. And then I wait a little while, because as I said, it's not the fastest process in the world. I check, yep, files are there or not. And I report that back to OpenMS. So this is groovy. So I'm going to walk semi line by line through this, kind of block by block. So the first, uh, you know, first first line. I hope everybody has an idea of that. It sounds like everybody's done some kind of scripting, so it should uh, two through six. So uh, I don't know if anybody's done Maven, but uh, this is very similar to that. Grapes will go out and grab your dependencies for you, so that's very handy. Um, I'm lazy, so. I like that. Uh, and then the imports. So you'll notice those imports, if you know Java at all, exactly the same. And then I have a class called Checker. And I have just one method in there of, of execute. And I use uh, um, the uh, SLF4J library for this um, on, on Marcus's suggestion. <laughs> so Start out with just a very basic log entry at uh, line 16, and then a try block. So a try block, you know, in in, in a lot of languages, is that I'm going to go try this, and if it fails, I'm going to have some some action I can take to recover gracefully. Uh, another log statement, um, and this is where you see I log out all that information I talked about that we receive from from OpenMS into the script. So. Always nice to see, what am I expecting to get? Am I getting it? Uh, and then I learned also in the troubleshooting that uh, that sometimes uh, uh, you don't know which script file you've configured in, in the Polar configuration. And then uh, line 24 um, <coughs> is where I create the NTLM hash to do my bind, or my... Uh, Authentication into the SIFs. And then 26 through 32, just kind of setting up some variables. You'll see uh, my path that I've set up, and then uh, the ICAR string. So that's the that's what I'm going to write to the file is that ICAR string. Um, and then a date string. And then uh, I had some, some counters as well that I used. And then I have just a for loop. Line 33 through uh, 44. And this for loop is uh, is uh, actually creating those files and writing them out to the NAS. <coughs> and then I wait for five seconds on line uh, 45. And then very simply, I just uh, go and check for them. So I name them sequentially so that I can go and check the check for them as well. Um, it's it's funny though when 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 things go wrong, I, I log into that share and I go. Boy, I got to clean this thing out manually. <laughs> I didn't think of a way to deal with that, and and maybe some maybe sometime I'll just add that to this is delete those files. But it's kind of nice to be able to go in there and say you kind of get another check of the trend for this this problem. Uh, line 56. I had some stuff around and and around uh, doing this multiple runs. Um, and so this this is very simple. It just returns an OK if it, if it worked. If it didn't, then we're going to go try again to see if those files are there. It's weird 
I don't know why it seems to work. Uh, with another sleep of 5,000. 5,000 millis, so that's five seconds. And then, of course, if, if that fails at line 74, I say, yeah, it, it didn't go. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Or sorry, that's that's another that's the, the second retry and it's fine. I thought about I should I should really make that a variable, right, and pass that across. And, but it seems like two seems to be good enough. Um, and that's the thing I want to stress is that don't get obsessive about it. just get get the job done. Sometimes you know that's that's something that I I'll get stuck up in sometimes is that I try to make this perfect. And, and also, don't feel bad about putting the stuff on the wiki. Because somebody else is going to come along and say, oh, well, that at least gets me started. <coughs> um, I don't know if anybody's taken this one. Maybe it would help them get started on something else completely different. I don't know. And then I'm going to go into my second example. Uh, log message in the text file. Uh, so I had issues with uh, radius authentication. So... Um, might have gotten from the previous that, that I, I uh, have a rather large wireless network. And what we're seeing is that uh, the radius would pass the authentication to LDAP, and LDAP would throw this MICE 53 DSA unwilling. Um, and what I learned through this process was there were other messages that basically caused the um, LDAP server to poison its connection. So if for some reason somebody kept pounding away and their account didn't lock, and it was the same account, and for some odd reason still belt of radius only creates one LDAP connection back, uh, it would say, oh, <laughs> there's somebody trying to hack me. I'm going to close that down until I reset the radius server because it wouldn't start a new, radius, new LDAP connection. Um, you know, so when I started seeing these failures, I couldn't figure out why am I getting this DSA is unwilling, why am I getting this DSA, I don't see, you know, I wouldn't see that same user, like, I, got, I want to say it was like 10 or, 10 or 12 times, I wouldn't see, and our account lock is at like 6, and for some reason, I wouldn't see, you know, I wouldn't see 6, I'd see 4, so it didn't, dawn on me until I had enough data to say, oh, it's the same user over and over and over again, but it's over maybe a several hour period, for some odd reason they stopped trying to authenticate. I, I, I never could quite figure that out. Um, but I think uh, if you're using OpenMS and you're doing data collection, you're usually doing a lot of data collection. You're getting as much data as you can because that's one of the beauties of it, right? You know, it's all you can eat. So just keep at <coughs> it. So I, I definitely knew that I could get, some, get somewhere with this problem if I could do that. Um, So it's pretty simple. All you do is uh, you add to smpd.conf, and this is also on the wiki. Sorry, I should put the URL for that too. Uh, and again, you know, just because it's very, this one is very specific to my environment, right? I put it on the wiki anyway because somebody might find something in there that's useful for their environment. They'll be able to adapt it. I mean, most, most people that use OpenMS are quite creative. Um, and you'll see that these were the, the five messages that I decided to look for. Uh, and basically the format of it is log match, what you want to uh, call that, the log file, frequency, and then uh, um, the message you're looking for. And so then in OpenMS data collection config, I just have the five instances that I created. And you'll <coughs> see that that, that, that prefix is the NetSMP uh, object ID. And just a simple counter. And uh, what I did is I ended up uh, creating a specific one for the Juniper SBR. Um, and I just added it to that. So it comes up as a node level graph. I didn't put the graph information in here. Um, but that's on the wiki as well. Uh, but you can see that there's, some, and I have some thresholds defined as well that I, I didn't also include in here. But the the gist of it is is that uh, uh, what I learned is as I watched the two rates change, I, I could find the problem much easier. 
and then we'll be on to Ron. We're kind of a little bit ahead of schedule. Looks like we have three minutes until lunch begins, but hopefully everybody found the first part helpful. And uh, if you want to, you know, grab Ron or I um, at lunch. We're more than willing to add stuff to this. Um, you know, as I said, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and if I have to, I'll bug Jeff or somebody else to help me out too. Uh, I think the thing that I, I always want to stress is that um, OpenMS is, you know, a platform to build on, and and that's I think the key thing. And if you watch some of the other talks today, you'll see that too. That it's 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 not it's 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 good good enough <coughs> out of the box, but it's really used to add on to that and make it really really truly awesome. <coughs>